My name is Anya Kearney. I'm Director of Business Support and Events at Tourism Northern Ireland. Thank you for joining today's session. COVID-19 has resulted in an unprecedented set of circumstances for both businesses and society alike. Our thriving tourism and hospitality industry has been hit hard and hit first, and it is looking unlikely that business as we know it will return to normal anytime soon. Now, more than ever, managing cash flow is critical to survival. With traditional income streams severely affected by C19, it's likely that many of you may be considering sourcing support from other funding avenues. Today's session will cover key areas that may support you in seeking and securing this additional funding. This includes working through a simple template that will assist you in articulating a clear financial ask, as well as demonstrating to investors how they will recover their investment. It will also highlight key areas that financial institutions are looking for, so that as you seek support, you can be prepared in advance. I hope you find this session helpful. We look forward to working with you in the months of recovery ahead. My name is Fergal McCormick. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of PKFFPM uh, Chartered Accountants, and I'm delighted to be uh, participating with you and leading the second web webinar in, this, in the uh, Tourism Business Support Seminar Series under the Tourism Northern Ireland's uh, Tourism Enterprise Development TED Programme. And uh, I'm also uh, delighted that I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Avery McShane and Ashok Thomas, who will, will help me answer some of your questions. And may I say at the outset that a very interesting and topical subject for today's webinar, uh, approaching banks and other funders uh, for tourism businesses. So without further ado, I suggest uh, we make a start. And it's fair to say that the government in London and the Northern Ireland Executive, as they plot out a course for the reopening of the economy in a phased and stepwise approach, uh, business continuity plans in, uh, in the Northern Ireland tourism and hospitality sector across a range of activities and business sizes will definitely come into sharp focus. And obviously the tourism and hospitality sector, as we know, is very important in the Ireland economy, employing 65,000 people and contributing over a billion annually uh, to the economy. Uh, and, and similarly, if you look at the entire uh, UK, sector, UK economy, tourism, hospitality and leisure activities are currently the third largest sector in the economy, representing 5% of GDP. And by the way, as a result, uh, the tourism and leisure and hospitality sectors are providing a very significant contribution in terms of the tax take for the UK economy. And therefore, it is hoped that a huge effort will be made and help by government to try and boost customer confidence, uh, since research is suggesting that 60% of the UK citizens are uncomfortable at the thought of attending large gatherings or events at present. And as we discussed last week in, in our first webinar, uh, the prospect of international tourists visiting Northern Ireland in the short term uh, would be low. Obviously, thereafter, uh, we will build again on the very positive steps that Northern Ireland uh, tourism uh, sector has done in recent years in terms of attracting international visitors. So for tourism and hospitality businesses, most of whom have experienced a cessation or a significant reduction in revenue, uh, there's no blueprint or a roadmap forward. For the, unique, for the unique issues being caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Indeed, uh, uh, you know, we're all hoping, uh, as most of you are, to contemplate, to contemplate, contemplate the, the recommencement uh, of trading. And despite many businesses, uh, despite this, many businesses are preparing uh, business continuity plans. And uh, we did a recent Pulse uh, poll survey actually last, uh, last Thursday, I think it was, uh, and we found that in Northern Ireland, 54% of those who participated in the poll had already some form of business continuity plan. Uh, it's important to appreciate, you know, that uh, if you think about it, a business just can't open its doors and start business again. It will need a business continuity plan. And, you know, if we're being honest, liquidity will be key to the reopening for businesses. Research reaffirms that planning and the implementation of an appropriate level of, of liquidity is crucial to defining the success of businesses, particularly it is believed in the recovery uh, of uh, the coronavirus. This will be very, very important, both uh, on the island of Ireland and obviously within Northern Ireland. 
naturally anticipating future market conditions and customer behaviors and attitudes will be pivotal to the success of businesses as they, as they plan to reopen and obviously taking into account their labor resource and talent management. So what we're really saying is that a new business landscape is evolving with expected changes in market and behavior attitudes. And we'll all have to, we'll all have to learn to do business in different ways. And we must focus our attention on re-engineering our business model going forward. <clears throat> this week's webinar uh, will focus on the preliminary business continuity planning process, uh, the core funding principles in terms of approaching banks and other funders. And I'm conscious in preparing this webinar that webinar three in this series will concentrate on working capital management, including cash flow management. So uh, we're leaving that to, to webinar three, albeit you cannot talk about approaching a bank without that being part of the, the ultimate high level uh, thought process. Now, as we, as we said again, you know, in terms of opening your business again in a, in a, in a coronavirus, post coronavirus uh, situation or indeed as an evolving COVID-19 situation, you'll also have to take into account the changing circumstances, which perhaps social distancing requirements uh, would put on your business in the short to medium term. And, and you must make sure you have enough we, enough cash to pay the wages at the end of a week or at the end of a month, whatever is most appropriate for you, enough to pay your suppliers at the end of the month, and to be honest, something left over for you, the business owner, also to, to, to help themselves to live. But it's equally fair to acknowledge that a crisis is a good time to take for us all to pause and take a holistic view of the business. And you know, we, perhaps we need to look at our products and services and see, do we need to adjust our product and service lines? Do we need to adjust our prices? Do we need to adjust our delivery channels? What's best of what we did before that we should carry forward? And perhaps there are some things we should not continue. And uh, the one sure thing is the key in the current environment will be a business with a strong financial planning and liquidity position. Now, what do we hope to achieve from today's webinar? Well, I suppose four, four core objectives. One, I think in order to approach a bank smartly, you have to have a, an understanding and an appreciation of the different types of funding and the importance of appropriate debt structure. And then obviously, we'll briefly touch upon the accessibility or the eligibility of your business for the various UK government and NA uh, executive uh, uh, grants and, and other measures to assist the, the significant temporary reduction in your business activities or perhaps the cessation of your activities and the slow take up of your business going forward. And uh, I, I suspect a number of the questions at the end may focus on these more directly. Then how to approach your bank with a bank proposal and that's what we're going to, we're going to take you through an outline bank proposal and what you would might normally expect to be in each section of that bank proposal. And in, in, inherent to that is the preparation of financial projections, including a, a cash flow statement. So as I think we said the last day in, in our resilience webinar, it's important to appreciate that our present circumstances don't determine where we go. They merely determine where we start. If you think of Barack and Michelle Obama, you know, uh, they started in very humble beginnings and they finished up at one stage, probably the most powerful family in the world. What is important is to appreciate that if you don't have a destination, you'll never get there. If you and I had not decided to participate in this webinar today, we wouldn't be in it. And therefore, it's key to remember that failing to plan is planning to fail. We must try and have a desired destination. And if you think about it, we can analyze the past, but we must design the future. And that means putting things together to deliver a value-added solution and perhaps hopefully exceed customer and client's expectations through differentiation, through creating a competitive age for our business. I'm a great follower of the, the, the fantastic uh, dynamic basketball coach of years gone by, John Wooden. And uh, he highlighted that success is found in the running of the race when he said, how you run the race, your planning, preparation, practice and performance counts for everything. Think about that. Winning or losing is a byproduct and an after effect of that effort. Believe it or not, in all his team talks, he never once, never once talked about winning or losing the match. And I was very interested to hear a webinar recently from Jim Galvin, the Dublin 
like football manager. And believe it or not, he claimed that he never once, in the course of a team talk, men said to his team, go out and win the match. He asked them to go out and get their performance right. So what we're really saying is that uh, it's the quality of the effort that counts most and offers the greatest and most lasting satisfaction. And you know, to put that another way, we should never cease trying to be the best we can come at every time. Because success is a, is a peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to become the best of which we are capable of. And if you remember in webinar one, I think we referred to the mirror at home. And if any of us can look at the mirror at home tonight or any night and say we give it our best, well, you can do no more. Don't worry about the mistakes. We all make mistakes. The person never made mistakes never got anywhere. So what is the process in starting to develop, now that we're pausing, and instead of pause, just the present, a, a business strategy for the future to, 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 to make sure we effectively have a business that is able to exploit the recovery uh, post-COVID-19? Well, you start with your current position, and you then carry out SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And within the SWOT analysis, you apply a thing called, we refer to it in webinar one, pestle analysis, which is you look at factors outside your control from a political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal perspective regulations, which may affect your business. You then start to generate ideas. And when I say you, not you personally, please involve uh, significant members of your, of your team and your management team as well, inviting them to come up with OFIs, opportunities for improvement. You then evaluate these ideas, you develop plans and milestones, and it's at this stage then all of a sudden you would, you would actually go and approach uh, your bank or funder. And then after you've done that, and hopefully you've got the funding, you would then manage and monitor the outcomes of how your business is doing against targets. So last week, we, we highlighted the fact that we had developed a, a, an integrated holistic a strategic management tool called the, the PKF Rocket, PKF FPM Rocket. And really, if you think about this, what this really says is that the strategic plan uh, basically uh, is what the vision is about. And then the business plan accepts the vision uh, as it is, and it revisits it in a way to achieve it through, you can see, putting in place the strategy, the structure, obviously the glue, the, inter, the interwoven glue, uh, the culture, and then your five operational plans, your products and services, uh, your marketing, your sales, how you're going to market the business, your systems and processes, finally, finance resources, and more importantly, the mud in the middle, it's vital, people. Business is all about people and relationships and managing talent. So, then applying that to a funding and cash planning perspective, planning is needed for the funding uh, and cash the business requires, when it requires it, and where it will come from. So, these things don't fall off a tree. It does require planning. And all of this must be underpinned by a risk assessment. And we talked about that last week in, in Resilience in, in webinar one. And cor 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 sorry, alongside the risk assessment will be forensic and sensitivity analysis, managing expected receipts and payments inclusive of any estimated error. So you allow for slight changes in your assumptions. And the strategy for commercial revenue will vary significantly depending on the size or scale of your activity uh, uh, and, and what, what activity or product or service that the business provides. But the fundamental concept is the same. And it's fair to say that there are many aspects of financial planning in these unprecedented circumstances that all businesses will need to consider. I had an old mentor who used to always say, Fergie, if you take the skins off most businesses, they're the same. The concept's the same. So the very first question you really have to ask yourself whenever you think about funding your business is a really important one. Don't jump in and ring the bank. Don't jump in and go and ask your family to use your money. First of all, identify what is the cause of the funding requirement? Why do you need the fund? For example, is it to fund cash losses? Is it to fund working capital? Is it to fund a capital investment? Is it to fund research and development? Or is it to fund international trade? And the reason why this question is so important is because depending on the answer will influence the most appropriate form of funding and the most appropriate source of funding that you should be approaching. Now, in terms of source of funds, look, we could give lectures or webinars to the cows come home. But in, in, for the purposes of this uh, webinar, we've summarized them hopefully on one page. 
And then we go into some of the more detail that we think is more appropriate to the tourism and hospitality sector. It's fair to say at the very outset, the cash flow within the business can be, can be supported immediately by seeking an extension from your creditors or negotiating reductions in your outstanding debts. And I'm conscious from another poll we did uh, with businesses in Northern Ireland last week that many businesses have already started and actually have undertaken this process. Now, another thing to consider is the refinancing of existing unencumbered assets, of assets which aren't secured. And certainly, we have a number of clients in terms of the hospitality sector who did this, who decided to raise some money on the back of unencumbered assets. And I suppose to be fair, uh, I also seen a BMW being sold up because the business concluded that they didn't need this particular BMW asset and it was surplus to requirements and it generated cash. Um, it also, to be fair, reduced some monthly payments as well. So in terms of bank debt, and obviously towards the end of the, the seminar, we're going to focus on how to actually approach the bank specifically as opposed to other funders. But the banks currently offer a number of different types of finance. And this will influence also your bank proposal. For example, overdrafts, there's term loans, there's invoice discounting, and there's asset finance. Asset finance is where you fund a specific asset, that will be a HP or leasing or lease hire. So then promoters equity, which is your money, the owner's money, or it could be, to be honest with you, preference shares or quasi loans. Quasi loans would be a combination of some form of perhaps uh, fixed dividend return uh, if, the, if the business makes money. Working capital finance is really uh, all about uh, the cash flow cycle. It's about managing your debtors, your creditors, your stock, and your work in progress if that's appropriate to your business, uh, and then uh, cash management. Uh, grants and financial incentives, obviously we talk about that in a second or two, again briefly because it's, it's, it, it alone will be the, the subject matter of a separate webinar. Uh, trade finance, it's important, trade finance can be important for some of our businesses in the tourism and hospitality sector and it can relate to both domestic or international trade, for example letters of credit, export credit and factoring etc. Loan funds, and we're going to talk about a few of those because Invest in I, for example, are supporting a number of loan funds at present. And then there's other alternative funding uh, sources that I'm sure you may have heard of or may not, such as venture capital, business angels, uh, private investors, uh, enterprise investment scheme, which would come to a very attractive tax incentive for some private sector investors in businesses. And finally, peer-to-peer -peer loans. You, you probably hear, we're hearing a lot about, for example, the funding circle at present. That is a peer-to-peer -peer loan, and we'll explain that later on, on crowdfunding. It is important when you look at different types of funds, always to look at it from the perspective of the organization giving you the money as well. And it's fair to say the, the cost of funds is linked to risk reward. For example, um, uh, where the risk is highest, for example, your own money which you don't get back. It's not guaranteed the the business does well. That's where hopefully the reward is greatest. But it means if the business doesn't go well, unfortunately, there is no reward. Whereas with bank debt, which is the other end of the scheme, the bank is guaranteed or should be guaranteed a level of interest. Obviously, under the, the business interruption uh, coronavirus scheme, the government is guaranteeing the interest for the first year and it's similar with the bounce back scheme. But normally speaking, uh, debt has fixed interest requirements and you have to pay them irrespective of how the business is doing. Now in terms of bank funding, uh, working capital funding, which is what we talked about is the core to business at present in terms of operational things. We've already talked about the overdraft. Invoice discounting is where you raise finance on your, your receivables, on your, your debtor book. Uh, and finally, a stocking facility, again unusual in some tourism and hospitality industry, but again, there is places, as you know, where some suppliers do provide stock facility loans. Uh, asset back funding we referred to already. Um, business growth expansion is normally funded by commercial loans, to be fair. Um, and specialist funding uh, is we have small business loans or even loans by the European Investment Bank, a lot more specialist and not, to be fair, the purpose of today's presentation. Now, in terms of grant assistance, you know, this is very, but being realistic, you have the COVID-19 supports and unsecured loan assistance, which we come to specifically because obviously these webinars are taking place in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. 
You then have support from Invest NI in terms of various normal grants like marketing activities, employment grants, training, capital investment, research and development, mentoring, etc. etc. And at present, what happens is these are provided by Invest NI, who normally and quite often consult with tourism in Northern Ireland in terms of getting a view on whether they believe that the project is relevant to the Northern Ireland tourism product or service. Then you have grants available from organisations like the Arts, Country, uh, Arts Council, the Big Lottery, the Community Foundation, Heritage Lottery Fund and Northern Ireland Screen. And we've been aware of businesses in the tourism and hospitality and leisure sector in Northern Ireland uh, all gaining some support from these depending on the nature of their activities. You always have the Department of Agriculture, Environmental and Rural Affairs, um, <clears throat> basically just at present the RDC. Uh, programs are currently closed, but again, I have no doubt they'll open again. And then you have the local enterprise agencies and district councils, mainly providing, it's fair to say, mentoring support and mentoring programs. And finally, you have Intercreate Ireland, which provides uh, a number of grant assistance programs to help with businesses involved in cross-border trade. So, briefly, and I'm very briefly, just to do a, a very high level uh, explanation of what some of these things are, uh, venture capital, uh, in terms of venture capital business engines and EAS, venture capital basically, it provides long-term monetary investments in exchange for equity in the business. Now, it's, it's fair to say it's certainly a form of risk capital, uh, unlike a bank, no guarantee return. And the majority of venture capital firms, the, the, normally the minimum that they would be investing would be 150,000, that could work in millions. They're mainly involved in expansion stage companies, fast growth businesses, MBOs, managing buyouts or managing buy-ins. Now, on the other hand, business angels, they tend to be uh, interested in making investments between 15,000 and 150,000 in startups and early stage financing businesses. It's fair to say that business, and from our experience anyway, and business angel networks are becoming more common. Uh, they normally feature highly successful uh, self-made entrepreneurs who look to acquire shares and potentially lucrative early stage companies using their own funds and may even uh, be willing to provide free advice uh, to the business owner. Now, I mentioned earlier the Government uh, Enterprise Investment Scheme, which basically it provides tax relief uh, to private investors who invest in business that meet specific requirements uh, uh, set down by HMRC. Uh, certainly, uh, for anyone looking for a type of investor from Business Angels, uh, this is an area that you would explore first of all, because the investor is attractive if he, if he or she can get EIS uh, tax credit relief. And finally, <clears throat> we talked about the peer-to-peer -peer loans. And they're really lending platforms. For example, that's what Funding Circle would be. It's a peer-to-peer -peer loan, which arrange loans from groups uh, of individuals or organizations to entrepreneurs looking to grow. It's a way for a business, to be honest with you, to get funding without having to visit a bank. And lenders can then use the platform like a marketplace where they choose who they want to lend money to. And as we mentioned earlier, crowdfunding, it basically offers lending opportunities also for startups and entrepreneurs. And basically what happens is they, they go onto a crowdfunding uh, website and uh, multiple investors make small investments up until the amount of money is required. Um, it's again high risk money and uh, these people normally are looking for uh, a, a, an equity return. Uh, even though it's debt, they're looking for a higher return. And uh, sometimes they'll take a uh, uh, a form of service in return or your product in return for financial uh, support. So having basically looked at all those finances, there's one other uh, form of support I would like to draw your attention because it's very relevant to the tourism and hospitality sector and it's, it's administered by InvestNI, overseen and supported by InvestNI. And that's basically um, uh, the Invest in Ireland in access to finance strategy. And uh, it has a, a number of equity funds, which we'll refer to very briefly, and we go into more detail into their, uh, into their uh, four loan, three loan funds at the start. In terms of co-fund NI, uh, that's delivered by, on behalf of Invest NI, the Clarendon Fund Managers, and it's a 50 million equity fund. 
one. So if you look at this diagram, very simply, I won't get into too much detail, it lets you see that if you look at the equity funds, you can see the tech start, which are for tech companies supported by the European Regional Development Fund. They range from loans from 50,000 up to 2 million. Where the co-funded fund, uh, the 50 million pound fund range from loans from 150 to 1.25 million. And finally, the Crescent 4, uh, fund, which is for larger uh, entities and business projects, uh, it's a fund of 54 million, and they range from about 500,000 to 5 million loans. The more interesting ones for the tourism and hospitality sector are the loan funds, which are the small business loan fund, the growth loan fund, and the growth finance fund. And I'm going to briefly uh, explain those to you. The small business loan fund has eight million pounds in it, and it, it basically uh, provides loans of between 1,000 and 100,000 to established businesses and one to, one to 15,000 for startup businesses. Uh, you have to provide evidence that bank funding was refused in the first place. And to be honest with you, it normally would be unsecured debt. In terms of the growth fund too, again, 30 million pounds provided in this and backed by Invest in I and the European Regional Development Fund. And this provides loans from 100,000 to 500,000 with a flexible term of two to seven years. And it has the ability, though it's quite rare, to fund up to 1.5 million. Typically unsecured debt, but what happens now and again is you find they may seek a second ranking charge. And finally, the Growth Finance Fund, uh, managed on behalf of Invest NI by White Rock Capital Partners. This has been very successful to date. It's a 30 million loan fund. Uh, you've got to demonstrate growth potential to get access to it. And loans typically range, these will be for large tourism projects, in particular leisure projects. These typically range from 500 to 2 million. Um, loans are provided on commercial terms and you must identify the funding gap and demonstrate very important here, the ability to repay the loans from your projected cash flows. Certainly any of these three schemes, you would definitely require a form of bank proposal and business plan. So having done, having really summarized, I hope not too quickly, but in a reasonably complete way, the various sources of funds that are out there, let's look at the key criteria which funding providers are looking for. <clears throat> they want you to certainly make sure that you you're quite clear and concise in your understanding of the level of funding you require and for what purpose. You remember we talked about earlier, the cause of the funding. They want you to demonstrate you have ability to repay the borrowings because these are borrowings, remember. They want to confirm, the funder will want to confirm for themselves they believe the business case is realistic. Nobody can forecast the future with any certainty if they could, we'd all be billionaires. But it has to be reasonable based on the assumptions. They'll be looking for growth potential in the business. And to be fair, they'll be looking at you, the project parameter, uh, project promoters. Do you have the ability to deliver the project? Have you shown this ability? Whatever you've done, nothing maybe to do with business, or perhaps in the business you were running before, COVID-19. Now, there are a few things to always appreciate in debt financing, which if you get wrong, can unfortunately lead to the cessation of your business and insolvency very quickly. And they're very simple core underlying funding principles. And they're these. You borrow for long-term needs with long-term debt. What that means is if you have an asset you expect, you, you expect to have an economic life beyond one year, for example, say a car, for example, say uh, uh, your property, uh, for example, say fixtures and fittings of a value over a number of years, then basically you, you, you borrow for that over its expected economic life and that's what you borrow long-term debt. But on the, on the alternative situation, if you are borrowing for short-term needs, for example, to fund uh, either uh, ordinary uh, operate trading activities or indeed cash losses, then it's short-term debt. And it's important you, you match the term, the lease, the, the, least the HP agreement is the asset finance, as we've already said, with the expected useful economic life of the asset. It's fair to say that the difficult economic climate we're in at present is acknowledged. However, the banks mainly, again, to be, to be honest, to acknowledge government support due to the COVID-19 assistance from the government are funding businesses and that they consider to be viable uh, post the COVID-19 pandemic. What they're not funding is, is businesses they deem were not viable before the COVID-19 pandemic. They don't want to be the lender of last resort. So 
Now we're getting into what we really want to do, and this is helping you approach the bank. And really for the rest of the, the webinar, we're going to focus on bank finance, how you approach your bank, albeit a lot of what we cover will be applicable to other funders. Uh, so I think it's fair to acknowledge, first of all, that banks are keen to work with their existing clients uh, and build on trusted relationships, and indeed with prospective new clients. And that a sensible mix of debt and equity is important. It's fair that back to that risk reward that we talked about earlier on, banks are not there to take an equity risk for a banking return because they get low interest returns. Bank will want to see project promoters accepting some pain. Now, this is very important. You know, I, I remember one time doing a bank proposal, it's straightforward, it's gonna, it was virtually approved, and uh, oh, uh, my client virtually gave his fingers up to the bank, and in the morning uh, that uh, he was about to hear what was going on, uh, he called into his local bank and parked his new Porsche outside. He didn't get the bank loan. You know, you've got to be careful. Banks will be looking for the project promoters to demonstrate that they're accepting some pain and also some investment in the project. There will be that famous thing we talked about before in a different perspective, a commercial and a reasonability check. And does that bank proposal, does your proposal look realistic in the context of the current market environment, COVID-19, in the context of competitors and in the context of returns? So what does your bank proposal look like? In very simple terms, these are the headings we think you should fit in in your bank proposal. And again, as one who, for whatever reason, has written quite a few bank proposals in his business career, I think actually the first thing you should do is put the headings on a sheet of paper, because that allows you then to get focus on what you're actually thinking and how you're going to present the information. So in very simple terms, and by the way, this would be extended out for a business plan, but a lot of it's the same concept. Executive summary, Business overview, coronavirus impact in the current environment, historic financial position, outline the business case going forward. Remember, the bank's interested in the future because that's what they're giving you the money against. Uh, financial projections with achievable and realistic assumptions. The funding requirement and the funding request. Very important. What do you want it for and how much you look for? Then you've got to identify, and this is better you do it than you let the bank do it on the other side because take it for granted. If you, you should be aware that whenever you put your proposal into a bank or a funder, they interrogate it and they put it through what's called sector key, key performance indicators and smart objectives to see how they think it stacks up or what they believe will be reasonable for your industry. So if you're smart, you actually do these calculations for them in advance to enhance your own case and your knowledge of your business and sector. And then you apply some sensitivity analysis. For example, it could be if, if the business, if the opening is deferred for another two months because of COVID-19 or if it's, if it's uh, tailored in or staged in over a number, a number of months. Again, if that is varies, then you can use sensitivity analysis to reflect different assumptions. And finally, your conclusion. So the executive summary, probably the most important section of the entire uh, bank proposal, because if, if some people told you the truth, they don't read your full bank proposal. If they don't like the executive summary, they don't go anywhere else. That's a particular decision. And the executive summary is very important because it basically you should include in the key business highlights, summarize the key strengths of the business and why under normal circumstances, it's a good business to support if COVID-19 was not there. State the reason for the funding requirement, indicate the nature and amount of the funding, how often have we repeated that again this morning, required, and the expected duration, that's also very important. Do you think you want the loan or the debt for one year, six months, two years, five years, whatever? Now, it is important in the current environment that, that because of the, the fact that um, both, well, obviously the, the, uh, the, the, the bounce back uh, loan scheme from 1,000 to 50,000 is 100% guaranteed by the bank, uh, by the government, and the, uh, the the business interruption loan, the first 250,000 is guaranteed by the government. So there's no security or get personal guarantees required from the business owners. So it is important that if you're thinking of seeking support under those schemes from your bank, who will then apply to the British Banking uh, Organization to get that approval from the government, you highlight that in your executive summary. Where possibly you should also indicate the serviceability, you know, and the repayments in due course that you're able to do that, that you're that you have capability. You should provide a, a table, a very quick table in that executive summary of your current bank debt and your proposed bank debt. And finally, 
provide details of the security if it's, if available, if it's appropriate. For example, if you're using the, the business interruption loan and you're, you're, you're seeking less than 250,000, it's not appropriate. But if you're seeking a million or two million or a million and a half, well then you're gonna to have to address that thorny issue. What's the current security and do you have any headroom in that secure, in, in, in assets to provide all that security? Now, you then move on to the, the business uh, overview section. So the business overview section is, again, reasonably straightforward. You provide a brief, but it's amazing how often, whenever you read some of these plans, they go off on a tangent. It needs to be concise, but straight to the point. I, I have read plans in the past, bank proposals myself, that people presented me before I took them to me. And to be honest with you, they really weren't concise, they weren't clear. So a brief overview of the business operations and the market in which the business operates, really important. Where relevant, provide details of changes to be made to the management or the wider organization as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Highlight management expertise, very important because business is all about people and people and relationships. The people, number one, the people that's going to run your business in the future. Highlight what expertise you think they will bring to the business and their responsibilities. And perhaps that will vary depending on what the bank's knowledge is of your organization at present. And then don't be afraid to provide any additional relevant information, background to the bank that would be helpful for the bank to understand you and your business and your business proposal. Then basically we move on to the, the coronavirus impact. And really to be honest with you, that, that's what's giving rise to so many bank proposals at present. Because let's be fair, in the tourism, hospitality and leisure sector, so many businesses have had a cease and no revenue. Others have been significantly curtailed. So you have to highlight the key issues experienced by your ability and identify the risks as a result of the uh, of these issues on payroll, on staff, staff cost, staff availability, supply chain, customers, etc. In terms of staff, obviously you refer to the furlough scheme if you're able to benefit from it. And then you try and assess the impact of the coronavirus uh, crisis on your business in terms of current and future sales current, if it's nil, then nil, and future sales revenue, in terms of the cost of purchases, in terms of your supply chain, uh, for example, you know, is any of your key suppliers located in areas which are going to be affected by COVID-19 going forward? And is that going to impact upon your supply chain? Obviously, anticipate the availability of labor, uh, debtor collection, and supplier credit terms. Now, in for, uh, we haven't really referred to that dreaded word Brexit yet, but make no mistake about it, in terms of your supplier chain, it may be appropriate also to make a comment uh, on the Brexit there. So, Having then looked at the key risks, you highlight the steps that you've already taken to mitigate and manage cash flow within your business. And any opportunities that you take, and this is an important point, Don't there will be opportunities. So please highlight what you believe are opportunities that your business can avail of uh, uh, in terms of the COVID-19 supports, and then more importantly, market opportunities, business market, and we'll come to that later on. So in terms of the supports, obviously, did you qualify for the, the rates relief, the, the three months rate, rate relief? Were you able to defer uh, VAT or POA or income tax or corporation tax payments? Were you able to enter into arrangements with your uh, HP or loan providers or mortgage providers to defer the payment for three, four, five months? Um, as I said earlier, were you able to benefit from the Corona Job Retention Scheme? And again, if so, how many staff, et cetera, et cetera, what percentage of staff and what is the wage saving on that? The, or alternatively, did you benefit yourself from the self-employment income support scheme? That's if you're self-employed. Uh, did you qualify for the £10,000 small business grant? Or now that they brought in the, the, the new scheme for rental properties, or properties with a total net asset value, net annual value less than I think uh, uh, just under £2,000. Uh, Did you qualify for the 25000 Retail Hospitality Tourism and Leisure Grant? All of these things, if you did, you would state. Obviously, the new hardship fund um, announced last week, but details yet to really be finalised and be published, if you think you're going to benefit from that. And uh, we've already referred to uh, the Corona virus business interruption loan scheme uh, and the bounce back loan scheme. Again, you'd refer to these if you think your business uh, can benefit from them. You, you, you then, in that context of these effects of coronavirus, you would then describe the cash flow constraints and the challenges that are arising or you anticipate will arise. 
and you'll give details of any actions you've taken. And these are very important, and I, certainly in the number of bank pros that I've been involved in, these have been significant, where people have shown what they did already. It's really important because, you know, one of the dangers is it's always easy to talk about what you're going to do in the future because there's a bit of uncertainty about that. But you can't hide what you did last week, but you have to tell it as it is. So show if, you, if you've undertaken already actions, and I'm sure many of you have, your business has ceased, you know, due to COVID-19. There's a whole lot of uh, costs you would have reduced, and there's a whole lot of direct actions you'd have had to take, unfortunately. And some of those could have been for locking staff, etc. Some of them could have been uh, entering into deferred arrangements with entertainment or licensed providers, etc. Music providers, you know, etc. All your suppliers, what you've dealt with, if you were involved in taking deposits from clients, etc. How you're dealing with our vouchers. And then details of any scenario planning that has been run to estimate the cash requirement going forward. Historic financial position. I hope you're seeing there's a bit of structure to the way this is being presented. Again, very simple. I, you know, you can't bluff it. These, these really are reasonably straightforward stuff. Your most recent annual financial statements, your own most recent management accounts. Now, you can imagine you going to the bank and asking for money and you tell them your management accounts are maybe due last October or September. What will think of you? That won't give the right impression. So if they're not up to date, get them up to date quick because it gives the raw impression if you don't have up-to-date management information. And then provide them with the most up-to-date list of debtors and creditors and the list of direct debits, perhaps the ones that you've spoken to and you've decided to defer uh, and the ones um, and you'd like to cancel and the ones you want to pay because of what they're what they're related to. Then I would your current bank facilities and provide a brief comment, right? Brief, you know, brief on historical performance, profitability, etc., and what's working for you, and what what activities or what segments of your business are making the most money or making the least money, etc. Then you move on to the next section, which is the outline business case going forward. So the one good thing is we don't yet know when COVID nineteen will end, but we do know it will be temporary. So we must be in a position to have a potential sustainable business going forward to exploit the recovery. Now, if we don't have that, we're better at going to the other bank and we're better doing something else. But if we believe we have that to you, that in very simple terms, I believe that from a business perspective, I suggest you, you focus on preparing for the recovery, utilizing what's called the technique of the three R's. You plan to reset, so reset the business model. What are you going to do? Refocus, focus in particular areas where you think you're going to now put more attention. And finally, show an energy and a passion that you wish to rebound faster. As I have hinted earlier on, it's certainly very good, and hopefully you have thought of these, to identify some opportunities that you've identified as a business opportunities as a result of the coronavirus in terms of trends said, that you think you may be able to to exploit, for example, changes in customer profile. Obviously, less international visitors mean you're going to be targeting in terms of uh, the tourism product. Uh, you're going to be targeting people, uh, ex targeting people who you think will want to uh, participate in staycations at home. Uh, I think there's there, there is believed to be thankfully uh, there's going to be a, a demand for increased use of leisure facilities, perhaps a change in lifestyle. Um, perhaps people that carry my weight will be very conscious. Of trying to get the weight down a bit, and um, uh, I think you uh, we talked about the last day probably the whole drive maybe towards healthier foods, foods that enhance the immune system. And within the tourism product, moving away from food, then how your tourism product or service can address um, uh, some of these things. And it's fair to say that uh, one, of, one of some of the things to think about is 24 7. There is a belief particularly with social distancing and the potential that a lot of uh, organizations, not in tourism, the hospitality management, will actually have to expand their hours. But there is a belief that there, that there may well be a demand for 24-7 services that will increase. And see, can you, is there some way you can twitch your business to address that? It's also acknowledged that the younger, all research shows that the younger generation are less fearful, and definitely that has been the case in respect of COVID-19. And perhaps there's a need to look at your you know, your customer tolerances in terms of your planning for the future. What customers do you think you can get back in earliest and what product or service would most attract them to your business? And, you know, again, always remember, it's not the what and the how, it's the why. Why would somebody want to come to your business? Why would somebody want to purchase your product or your service? 
And then obviously develop strategic lands with various activity tourism providers. If it's going to be staycation, I think the one good thing about this is in Northern Ireland, we have a number of very natural, natural uh, uh, assets, natural assets that perhaps with service providers and various other people, there can be strategic alliances working together uh, to exploit business opportunities. You then come to the financial projections, and I should say next week, uh, certainly within our working capital and cash flow management, we go into the actual uh, the, the cash flow forecasting a little bit more. But suffice to say, you've got to nail your financial model. Um, to be fair, my colleague Ashok Thomas, who's uh, uh, who's joining us for the questions, Ashok uh, highlighted a very good business model for cash flow in a podcast and uh, uh, you know he highlighted all the points we're talking about here now you've got to focus on it you've got to get your assumptions right start thinking you first of all have to start with your opening balance sheet then what are your sales assumptions how are they building up what is the different types of sales do you have three four or five different categories or not what is the cost the direct cost associated with each of those different types of sales and you can do that uh, and then you got to divide your cost base between Fixed, that's costs that, that won't change your respect of your activity. Uh, variable, that's costs that will change exclusively depending on your activity. And then there are some semi-variable costs, for example, management people. Well, you know, you have a core cost in, but maybe you won't be able to get full utilization until you achieve, achieve a certain level of activity, but you still have the cost. So you have semi-variable costs. You've got to then get in under your working capital assumptions and outline the key components. Read debtors, uh, that's receivables. Read creditors, that's people you, your suppliers, you pay money to. Read stock and work in progress. For example, one of the things we've seen in a number of our bank proposals at present in terms of the, uh, the hotel and the bar trade is the whole area of obsolete stock that um, wasn't thought of initially, but now there's a number of, there's a serious amount of stock actually now becoming obsolete and having to be destroyed. Certainly read your labour. Your assumptions uh, should reflect any furlocking you're, do, you're doing with staff and when you expect them to come off furlock. And to be honest with you, you know, um, it could well be uh, you will not be able to start back with the same number of staff that you had before COVID-19 and there may well be redundancies. And again, if that is the case, you need to, within your projections, provide for estimated redundancy costs. You'll obviously make assumptions for re-bank re bank or re -back. You'll also make assumptions for the nature of the, the bank debt. It could be a combination of overdraft, loan, and indeed asset finance. And obviously propose capital expenditure of their money and indeed grants if they're appropriate. But what will happen is ultimately, and I say we we'll go into this more detail next week, but ultimately you'll finish up with a cash flow forecast, I guess. Normally on a monthly basis, you'll probably have the COVID-19 interruption period, which will show massive negativity that your cash resources kept falling because you had no income coming in. You can see from May, you had no income in May there. You had a little bit of income in early April, but uh, no income in May. And um, no cash, I mean, not income cash, no cash coming in. And eventually, hopefully, as you trade forward, depending on your assumptions, in this model here, they're hoping that by January 21, your cash receipts will uh, exceed uh, your cash expenditure. But again, you'll back that up with figures, which will show the graph. Uh, and, you know, we'll go into that perhaps more next week or we'll take it in questions. But it's difficult, to be honest with you, to present in a straightforward webinar without boring people because it varies depending on the business. So, in terms of forecasting, you've got to decide in the interval, is it weekly or monthly? Uh, my advice to you would be, if you can, try and do it monthly. Uh, it's a lot more easier in the model. Um, you need to familiarize, familiarize yourself with forecasting tools, for example, such as Microsoft Excel. You've got to link, link calculations and assumptions so you can amend them later, and that's the great thing about using the right model, because it means you can, you can make very quick changes very easily. And you carefully uh, evaluate uh, every aspect of the business and include all the elements is appropriate for the cash flow, the operating costs, the financing costs, and the investment if you have to do more for that capital expenditure. And remember that social distancing. Remember we mentioned if you have to incur costs in order to meet social distancing requirements, you need to put those in, including, for example, uh, protective equipment or whatever for staff, extra security staff, perhaps on toilets to make sure small and the right numbers go in and out and the same in the uh, broad catering areas or areas of tourism attraction. You don't have too many people at any one time. 
Um, then basically in terms of assessing your proposal I mentioned earlier, you can look at the KPIs and determine what your key performance indicators are and how these compare with your, your sector competitors, your sales trend, your gross margin, et cetera, and your average debt or days and your debt to equity ratios. And finally, uh, in terms of finance, which is the focus of this data banks, you can take it for granted. If you don't do it, the bank will calculate these anyway. They'll calculate the times interest cover, which basically means the number of times uh, uh, your, your profit before interest in tax, your cash profit, uh, will cover your interest. So that means, is, say for example, your, your tax profit is, uh, is 100,000. Uh, and your interest is £25,000 a year, that means your interest is covered four times. And you can imagine if your cash profits fell to 50000 it will be covered two times. And banks have their own internal uh, criteria for that particular ratio. Similarly, they look at a debt service capacity, which is your profit before interest and tax, your add back your depreciation, which is your cash profit, and you look at loan and interest commitments over the next year, and that's capital and interest. Then you have the leverage percentage, which is another ratio they use, which is again basically putting uh, debt over net assets. And then you look at loan to value, which is really your total debt facilities value over the value of security. Yeah. The reason why I'm going over these quite quick is to be honest with you, all these slides will be available afterwards and they make more sense when you actually put actual figures into them. We also referred to early on the very start about sensitivity analysis. For example, we talked about, you know, can we sensitize your projections to say if there was a further delay before we started for two months, or if sales actually were 20% down on what we expected, or if the gross profit was down or up, what impact will this have on cash flow and working capital? And you can do that with the right model. That's very easy once you do it first. Once you do your first set of assumptions, then you can easily change for sensitivity purposes. It's fair to say that in terms of reviewing your bank relationship, regular review, understanding of the contents of facility layers, have a look at them. You'd be quite surprised. Uh, one that I know that people haven't picked up is the importance of regular information. Most banks now are going forward asking you for quarterly management information. And certainly review the security provided by the bank and any financial covenants that you have to adhere to. And uh, any regular updates, you know, it's amazing quite often you go out to a business. <laughs> The bank letters haven't been opened, they're sitting in a pile. Oh, I put that in the folder there. Now, please open the letters and read them, they can be quite important. And I would suggest to you that it's probably helpful to involve uh, an accountant in the process. So, in terms of preparing your pitch, just to become the conclusion of the presentation, a few do's. Is there a funding requirement? Don't go for a bank funding if there isn't a funding requirement. Calculate the cost of obtaining the finance. Obviously, you can estimate rough interest rates. Match the borrowings with the expected life of the asset, that's the structure of the debt. Discuss various options with your business advisor. Be aware of the risk versus reward that we talked about earlier on at the outset of the, of the webinar. And think about the funder's decision-making process. The key to everything in terms of grants, in terms of any application you're ever making, always put yourself around the other side of the table. If you were reviewing this application, what would you be looking for? And obviously, the more boxes you can tick that way, the better. And if it's relevant, don't be afraid to shop around. In terms of the don'ts, what I suggest is don't overcommit the business. Ensure there is an ability to repay the debt you're seeking. Yes, if you're looking at the other sort of forms of funding, go to a meeting with potential, don't go to a meeting with potential investors unprepared. Oh, disaster. And always remember whether it be a bank or another funder, in my experience, your first effort is your best. You're really better taking a little bit of time to get your first bank proposal right. It's a lot more difficult. You're on the back foot or you're having to go back and change and change and change. Uh, don't ignore the basics of good management because that's what business is all about, people. Uh, you got to get that right. And uh, as we've said on numerous occasions throughout this webinar, please don't use short-term finance to fund capital expenditure, for example, uh, to fund the fit out of something or to fund a new piece of equipment. Not good to use short-term funding. That's not what it's for. If the equipment is expected to have a life, an economic life beyond one year. So, common shortcomings that we come across, certainly banks share with us. Uh, generic proposals not specifically tailored. Excessive commentary and periphery analysis. That's what I was saying to be concise. Uh, you know, don't tell them who your 
your granny and your great granny were a necessary key to the business, key to the, the intellectual capital of the business. Uh, inappropriate sensitization of financials. You know, if you're doing sensitivity analysis, you got to make sure it's relevant. Uh, appropriate funding mix not identified. You know, you'd be amazed. I, I have a senior banking colleague friend who tells me that at least 25 to 30 percent of all bank proposals he receives, those three key things aren't aren't clear. How much are you looking for? What's the nature of the funding you're looking for? And what duration? It's hard to believe. And why you want it? Insufficient challenge from the advisor. A good advisor should never be a yes man or a yes woman. They should purposely challenge you so that actually it's a bit like a barrister if you're going to the court. Your advisor should actually ask you harder questions than your bank will ever ask you. So it's a, fair, a few final thoughts. You know, it's important to appreciate that banks aren't there to take equity risks. They don't get equity returns. Bank back people, not projections. Really important. It's the people that's behind the project. It's the project itself. It's not the projection. Anybody can create it. I mean, we can all create figures. It's having the rationale that there's a, just, there's a reasonless to those figures. Focus on the commercial reality underlying the cash flows. I would say don't be too aggressive. Build in a little bit of headroom. Uh, to be also be willing to invest in the relationship. You know, think about it. how often have you gone to your bank in the last few years when you didn't need money? Don't be afraid to update them how things are going. Take them out for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or go and meet them. And despite the, bank, the, the difficult banking environment we're in today, because of the COVID-19 government supports, to be upfront about it, banks, projects are getting backed and banks are banking projects. We're seeing it every day. So in conclusion, um, my final slide, uh, we carried out a post survey last week um, uh, as part of, during an Interfaith Ireland webinar. Uh, uh, and we asked uh, those participating, over 200 people particip were participating businesses, uh, non-land business, had they accessed the COVID-19 bank support initiatives? And surprisingly, uh, at that stage, over 24% had secured assistance uh, from their bank or were in the process, most in the actual process of securing assistance. Now, there's no doubt about it, we're currently experiencing unprecedented uncertainty due to COVID-19, with an economic recession forecast not only for the island of Ireland, but also for the global economy. And tourism in Northern Ireland, and indeed tourism in Ireland in terms of ultimately marketing to the international market, would play proactive supporting roles to the various businesses involved in the Northern Ireland tourism, uh, leisure and hospitality industries. But going forward, when the opportunity arises, the need will change to focus on strategy positioning. Think about that. Your strategy positioning going forward. You know, we're really over phase one, which was the shock of COVID-19. You know, we're virtually over that now. We've now got to get to the next stage of trying to get ourselves ready to create and put in place a business model which will develop an exciting and sustainable business for us. And hopefully, uh, today's webinar uh, on approaching banks and other funders uh, will help you on your future journey.